Hello, welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We have a great panel of experts put together today, ready to answer all your gardening questions because I know we're all just ready to jump in and get gardening. I'm Jennifer Nelson, I'm a horticulturalist, and I write a home horticulture blog at groundedandgrowing.co. And we've got a great panel here tonight that's gonna talk about a few, thing, few of your questions and show and tells. And so first we're gonna start off with John. John Bodensteiner? Yes, I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermaine County uh, Master Gardener. Um, my interests are well, tomatoes, um, perennials, fruits, uh, vegetables. Uh, if it's green, I'm usually pretty much happy with it. I've got all kinds of hostas in my yard. Uh, <clears throat> tonight, I've got a question. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to do show and tell. Um, tonight, I brought a couple of things from my uh, yard. Uh, the first is uh, pawpaw, and that, that's what this is, a pawpaw flower. Now, this spring, uh, I cut them off uh, right before it got real, real cold, and this right here is what the flower buds look like uh, before. Now, some of these did not mature, but some of them did, and normally, uh, when these get to this stage, um, they smell like rotting meat. Um, luckily for, for in here, uh, and being I force them, they're not real strong. And uh, the reason for that is one of the main um, pollinators are flies. Okay. So that um, usually attracts um, flies, the, the smell of rotting meat. So that's why the plant has, has kind of gone to that. The other thing I brought was a Lenten rose. Um, you can see there's different colors. Uh, it's also called hellebore, and uh, it's one of the earlier bloomers, and so I think it's, you know, it's been blooming. It, 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 even though we've had freezing temperatures, right. it kind of wilts, but then comes back, and uh, it just puts up a real show. As they get older, you get bigger and bigger um, blossoms, more blossoms, I should say. The plant gets a little bit taller, and uh, some of these, like this one here, uh, this one right here, you can see, is, is a very nice oh, size really. flower. So, um, they um, just a nice addition when you, I've, I've had them blooming even in the snow, so. That's really impressive, and considering we had temperatures in the teens, yeah. and those don't and they, seem to have been. They, they wilted, they looked like they were, they, they just fell to the ground, but as it warmed up, they slowly came back up and, right. and, and have been blooming since, and they'll bloom for another month at least. Oh, wow. Uh, see, I've had kind of mixed results with mine, but I think I finally found a variety that that um, likes where it's at. Mm -hmm. And it, like you said, it's getting a little bigger mm -hmm. and bigger every but year. But as, as each year goes by, the, the plant kind of will expand. And they'll also, if you let them um, go to seed, they will spread by seed also. Oh. I have people that they say are almost, they almost get to be invasive, but I've never had okay. that problem. Good to know. Thanks, John. Now, Mark. Hello, my name is Mark Kemp. I'm a landscape architect in Douglas County. Um, I have an email that's sent in here. Um, I have an apricot tree about three years old. Does it have to have another in order to get fruit? Um, they go on to say, I have seven young peach trees, but there's a row of pine trees between. Uh, would they help for pollination or should I buy another apricot tree? Um, it depends on what variety you have. But most likely, if it's three years old, it is an oriental uh, persimmon or apricot, and um, you uh, it will self-pollinate. So you should not have to. Um, the row of pine trees could be affecting a little bit of the um, uh, airflow around and just uh, how well it's pollinating itself. But uh, um, I guess just kind of keep it uh, pruned um, correctly, and you should should be fine with that. Usually Great. I found five to seven years on an apricot is, mm -hmm. is before you get any any real blossoms and fruit. Yeah. We've had more so issue with losing the losing the flowers to frost oh, and cold yeah. temperatures than anything. Yeah, there 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 would be that as well. So uh, um, not having a cold snap later in spring when the flowers are kind of at their most vulnerable stage would would also, uh, but there's nothing you can do with that. So right. um, just uh, hope for a good good flowering time and uh, you should be fine. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. We're going to go to our Did You Know video about asparagus. 
Asparagus plants can take up to three years to produce edible stalks, but once the plants start, they can be productive for up to two decades. Great information there. Spring makes me think about asparagus. That's one of my favorites. Let's go to the phones and see who's calling. Uh, on line two, we have Venus with a question on trimming roses. Yes, yes ma'am. Go ahead. Uh, I forgot to trim my roses last uh, fall, and now they're, <laughs> they're having leaves and they start to grow. Can I trim them now? Definitely, yes. Absolutely. Actually, I, I usually tell people not to trim their roses in the wintertime mm -hmm. or in the fall, mainly because you don't know how far, depending on the winter, how right. far they're going to die back. Right. Yeah. And this year has been extremely mild. I've got some that are leafing out too. Yeah. And I haven't trimmed mine back yet. You know, I, the only ones that I really trim back is those that get the canes get so mm -hmm. long that in the wintertime you can get some um, wind that whips them back and forth. And if you get a, a real cold spell, they crack and sometimes you can get dehydration or, mm -hmm. and uh, but now is the time to to get them trimmed back and uh, yeah it won't hurt them one bit no probably no. would help especially if you have a shrub rose you mm -hmm. don't want to have something that's enormous and taking over right. your front yard and as you put it you don't know how severe the winter is going to be how much snow covered there will be so uh waiting a little bit will allow that determination of where that green growth is great good information thanks guys we're going to go to line three. Birdie has a question on amaryllis. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my amaryllis just quit blooming. And now what do I do with it to be able to bring it back next, for next Christmas to bloom again? I would go ahead and treat it like any other house plant. And when it gets a little warmer out, I usually set mine outside, mm -hmm. um, give them a little fertilizer, a little balanced fertilizer. Um, I don't know how true it is. I'd read somewhere that as long as it had at least four leaves, you'd probably ha build up enough energy to, to bloom the following year. But just treat it like a greenhouse plant. And then about September, stop watering and let it die back. And at that point, if you feel like you want to repot it, you can uh, when you uh, bring it back in um, around Christmas time to, mm -hmm. to bloom. And then and don't it, put it, it in too big of a pot. Just right. move up one size because they said that it likes don't. to be a yeah. little tighter. Yeah. You may find some bulblets at the base and the, it's fine to break those off and put them in their own pot or I've seen people just leave them all in one pot together um, and kind of give a fuller effect. But the bigger that bulb gets, the more likelihood you'll have more than one flower stalk. So that's something to hope for. When it dies back, do I break those leaves all off? Um, yeah, they'll they'll get brown and brittle and kind of fall off on their own. So just wait wait for that to happen after you stop watering in September. I, if I've got my plants outside, I will tip the pot on its side so that um, it doesn't get any any rain on it. And usually just stick it in the garage too once it gets cold. And my garage doesn't freeze. So. Yeah, I wouldn't break. Don't break the green yeah. leaves off. No, don't break the green leaves. The, you need to have the the, the plant uh, re. Invigorate, reinvigorate the the bulbs so uh, as long as those leaves are green once they're turning yellow and brown then you can get rid of them but not until then okay all right well we're gonna um, encourage people to call in with your questions and we're gonna go through another round of emails here uh, John's got a question on tomatoes because people are always thinking about tomatoes no matter yeah. what time of year it is yeah. uh, I, I have a question here from uh, Martin and uh, they had some spotty tomatoes. Uh, my tomatoes have black spots on them and they feel greased. <coughs> what can I do about them? Please let me know. Well, I think what you have, at first I thought that you had some insect bites, but then I got to looking at the, the one picture where the, the, the green tomatoes and there's spots on the stems also. That leads me to believe that you have bacterial spot. Uh, as you can see on that picture right there, there's, and it's usually those spots appear on the green tomatoes and then on some of the stems, uh, even on the flower buds, if there's one of those uh, spots on the flower bud, it'll cause the flower to, to fall off. Uh, <clears throat> and what you should do is get rid of the tomatoes that have that spot on them, just get, get, 
take pick them even if they're not ripe and uh, get them away from the area uh, if in the fall you have tomatoes that you want to save seeds if that tomato has uh, spots on it do not save those seeds as you will have the disease transferred the next spring uh, <clears throat> another thing that you don't want to do is work around the plants when they are wet uh, brushing against them when it's wet will transfer uh, disease from one plant to the other so be very cautious what you should do is if you if it's not just do if it's, if you've been watering your plants start to just do the ground watering okay. uh, don't uh, overhead spray and uh, uh, that should uh, get rid of them eventually uh, what you want to do is try to find plants that are disease resistant to bacterial spot once you have it you want the next spring you want to make sure and plant your tomatoes in another area of the garden and clean up any re uh, residue at all of your plants leaves stems get rid of them don't uh, put them in the mulch just get rid of the, that particular plant and um, <clears throat> that should uh, should help one of the other questions I had on tomatoes uh, well it wasn't me it was a couple weeks ago a lady called in and she was having problems with her tomatoes uh, germinating on the window and I, I, it was cold at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, tomatoes to germinate require 70 to 80 degree constant temperature. So next time you want to germinate them, don't put them on your window, put right. them in a warm spot. When you're right up to the window like that, it can be enough it's, of a temperature mm -hmm. difference. It's got to stay to, 70 right. to 80 constantly. But all your tips, great tips on sanitation in the garden, because that's not just for bacterial spots. Yeah, it's but for, for all diseases. All right. diseases of tomato, so thanks a lot. Uh, Mark, you had a question on birch trees? Yes, um, a viewer wrote, um, neighbor's birch tree, which is, uh, they, they admire quite a bit. Um, everyone who sees a tree says that they have never seen birch trees like these. Um, they're curious on what species it is. It's, it's a little challenging to, to identify, you know, from a photo, um, but uh, they write, um, or were they trained that way? Can anything be done to save them? Large branches have been falling and one of the trees is now about half the size. So two things going on here. Obviously they are attractive trees. They're not a long lived species. So looking at the size of them, it could just be a little bit of age, but birch trees aren't the most, uh, um, uh, I guess, hardy trees mm -hmm. that, that exist. So they're gonna fluctuate with droughts. They're gonna fluctuate with like, uh, lots of fertilization in the lawn. Um, and then when they do get stressed from droughts, then they can get susceptible to um, birch borer mm -hmm. or insects. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a combination of things. So about the only thing you could do is just keep them as healthy as possible. So if there's a, a dry period, keep them watered um, and just take care of them that way. Obviously take any dead wood out of there and just try and keep them as healthy as possible. If there is, is a bore, uh, entry wound in the in the bark. You could treat that with an insecticide, but it just be managing it at that point. Um, but it looks like they've had a, a long life, and uh, I guess enjoy them while they're still there. Oh, great tips. We kind of forget that trees have a lifespan. We don't. Yes. We think that they're just going to be there forever. But great things to keep in mind. Okay, we're going to um, go over to our Mid American Gardener quiz on early spring vegetables. Which of these vegetables can be safely planted earliest in the spring? A. Garlic B. Okra C. Squash D. Eggplant A. Garlic Garlic is a hardy plant and can be safely planted in late March. It can also be planted in the fall as early as September. Okay, great information on garlic. I sometimes plant mine and so early in spring I plant it in the fall, but it can be <laughs> one of the first things that you put out yeah. in the, as soon as you can work the ground. We're gonna go back to the phone lines. We have several callers here. Let's go to line two. Mary has a question on onions. I have a question about onion sets or bulbs and onion plants. Which ones do you plant for green onions and which ones are more for onions that you want to keep? I think you can plant either one yeah. for either for either use. I usually see 
as plants the sweet onions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the only reason you're going to plant them for greens is you're going to cut them off right away. You're going right. to cut that top off. Right. So anything um, can be used that way. Right. And, and chives, is a, onion chives is another mm -hmm. one if you right. want to have that type of thing. Uh, you can use onion chives. But any of the onions you can plant, uh, most of the time you're going to see them advertised as yellow onions, white onions, mm -hmm. red onions. Um, and those are specifically for the bulb, but um, you can use the tops for any of them. Mm -hmm. I think it's the white onions that they usually use for, right. for the, uh, the shoots. And if you want to get an even longer piece of, of the white for the green onions, um, you can mount up straw over the onions after they come up and just you'll get a nice long white section for green onions if that's what you're after. Okay. All right, we're going to go to line three. Marty has a question on thornless blackberry bushes. Hello? Hi, Marty. Hi. Um, I had about six blackberry bushes that I was going to dig up, and uh, but my son yanked them right out of the ground a couple weeks ago. Okay. And I didn't know that. <laughs> and... Uh, but I was wondering if I'd put those back in the ground somewhere else, if they would uh, possibly grow still. Well, you have nothing to lose. Yeah, right. nothing to lose um, at this point. Uh, I would definitely put them in. Being we've had cool and it's been fairly wet, they probably haven't dried out a lot. So your chances of survival are much better now than they would be in July if right. you had dug them out and thrown Correct. them. But uh, I would definitely give them uh, a try. Uh, plant them at the depth that they were. Uh, clean off any dead, um, you know, dry branches, broken branches, and just keep them watered and uh, hope for the best. Yeah. yeah, depending on how they were removed, if there's still soil kind of attached to that root system, those roots would have had enough moisture to mm -hmm. kind of sustain a couple weeks. Um, if, if there's not much mass there, then you might have limited results. But if there's some mass there, you, you should get some results out of it. Yeah. And blackberries are one of those plants that are pretty tough. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might as well try. Okay, great. Um, we're going to go to line five. Shirley has a question on daffodils. Should I start? Yeah. Oh, okay. Welcome. I know I'm a little early in asking this, but as my daffodils are through blooming, I know I have to leave the stalks or whatever right. die back. How far dead? Do they have to be before I can pull them out? I just want to clean the garden up sometimes, and they're so ugly. Do they have to get completely brown? No, or I, as, as soon as mine start to yellow mm -hmm. is when I start to yank them or cut them off. Most of the time, if you go and they're yellow, if you just give them a little tug, they'll they'll yeah. come right out. If they don't, I don't pull on them. I'll, uh, you know, I'll 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 be tender with them and just cut them off at the ground level. Uh, but a lot of times they'll just just snap right off yeah. and but <clears throat> you don't have to let them brown as soon as they're yellow they're not putting any more energy back into the ground uh, there may be a little moisture there but the, the, the you know the, it, the soil has got lots for them to to rejuvenate what they mainly needed was the photosynthesis from the leaves to put that energy back in the bulb and once they're, they're yellow there's no more photosynthesis right. being a, yellow, done. a yellowing leaf is never going to no. go back to being green I've read that as long as they've got about six weeks of existence, that mm -hmm. that's enough photosynthesis. And daffodils are, are a lot more forgiving than tulips or mm -hmm. some of the others. Um, they're, they're pretty, pretty forgiving. And you could always, I mean, you could even think about planting a perennial mm -hmm. that would uh, leaf out earlier um, to kind of hide that transitional period so that you're not necessarily looking at wilting leaves. Right. Um, that'd be one way to do it. Or you could uh, kind of gather them up together and just kind of let them wither down but mm -hmm. I've seen some people actually fan them you know cut them at an angle and they kind of look decorative then you, you know cut the tops off and you know they'll start to flop over just cut cut them off because usually that end is pinched and you're not getting that much nutrients from that but if you just cut them at an angle um, uh, it, it kind of makes them look attractive yeah. too like you, you like you meant to do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> great great tips Okay, let's go to line four. Peggy, she has a question on beauty bush. I have a beauty bush that's probably 75 to 100 years old. Oh, wow. And I would like to take some sprouts off of it. Is it possible to dig those up and replant them? 
You're talking suckers at the base? Yes. Should be. Go for it. What have you got to lose? Yeah. I would say you take a, uh, a saw, some type of a saw, and make a vertical, vertical cut along the, the edge of the plant and free that so you're not disturbing the mm -hmm. main part mm -hmm. and dig that up. And that way you'll, you'll be able to get more root mass and more soil around that and, and plant it immediately. Take it and put it in the ground right away. Uh, water it in, uh, put soil back in so that uh, there's no uh, bare roots on, on the mother plant but I see no problem with doing that, as, you know, as, and especially then if you, where you cut, if you see little hair roots or mm -hmm. little roots, That's a good then, you're, then you're, you're almost home assured that you're home free. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. So go ahead and try that. Okay, uh, let's go to line six. Rick has a question on trimming rhododendrons. Yes, I have two rhododendrons. They're starting to bloom. I was wondering if it was all right if I trimmed one back to make them both size. I would say if you do it, do it right after they flower because yeah. your spring flowering shrubs are going to set their buds for next year during the summer. So if you're going to do it, uh, wait till right after they're done blooming. Yeah, if you do it now, you're going to lose, you're going to have one that's flowering and one that right. isn't. You won't kill it, but and it won't look yeah, it just, very it, well. It just won't, you, you know, you're going to lose uh, the, this year's flowering and why not just wait till after they both flower mm -hmm. and that way you can trim it and um, not lose any flowers for next year. You could also do it over a couple of years mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Um, take out much. a select few now, m maybe a little bit more aggressively leaving the other ones and then next year when those have kind of grown about the same level as your mm -hmm. other one, cut the other ones back a little bit. That way you don't have to look at like a non-blooming one oh, that you've yeah. cut back. That's yeah, a good that's point. Good. And remember, you don't want to be removing more than about 25 to 30 percent at mm -hmm. a time. Yeah. I don't know what the size difference is that you're talking about. Okay, uh, let's go to line two. Kathy has a question about my dad's favorite weed, Creeping Charlie. Hi, um, my question is, we have been taken over with Creeping Charlie, and it's now in my flower bed and also where we normally would plant our vegetable garden. So what my question is, um, I don't know what we could use to kill the creeping Charlie that's not going to affect the flower garden, but then I also don't know if I should be able to plant vegetables if I use something to kill it as well. Oh, this is, this is a weed near and dear to my heart uh, because my dad has spent like all of my whole life battling this weed. It's really tough even if you were able to find a a, an herbicide that would selectively kill it, it's its difficult to do. Um, yeah. Pulling yeah. it when it's in flower is probably the best time to try and pull Now's it. Now's the best time to pull it because yeah. I've, I've got or, some that is coming into my lawn and I've gone <coughs> right now when the soil is not compacted, you can take and find and, and pull it up and you, you may have a whole yard full of, mm -hmm. of uh, Creeping Charlie that, you, that you've pulled up where in the summertime, if you try to do it, it breaks off at every node, right. and it's a real uh, Yeah, you problem. have those individual root systems mm -hmm. that just are just one right after another. Yeah, any little bit left behind. Just but yeah, it, it, like worst. you said, if you, any broadleaf uh, spectrum uh, herbicide is going to not only kill your flowers, but also probably kill any vegetables or, right. or a thing like that. And and uh, so that that's why I'm saying hand weeding in your mm -hmm. situation is probably about the only, unless you just want to skip one year. My dad had really good luck using a dethatching rake and that mm -hmm. really did, it took him amazing amount of time, but it, it. but it finally worked. He just kept at it. This time of year, I think just, you know, just getting a hold of the, the, the mm -hmm. vine that's that spreads because it it can spread like you, you you found out it can spread from this side of the yard over maybe four or five feet uh, in one uh, one fall to the following spring because mine never did mm -hmm. die back this winter and it loves and partial shade yeah. where it can be tough to grow grass yep. it, it was actually brought here as an ornamental yeah, yeah, and yeah. a medicinal plant yeah. so you had mentioned that it was in like a landscaping bed as well. Um, that you could rejuvenate your, I mean, you could dig up perennials, mm -hmm. clean most of the mm -hmm. soil away, then actually eradicate or dig out the creeping Charlie, and then just kind of start over and replant them or transplant them back in. You might have some success doing mm -hmm. that. 
but prepare yourself. It will be be a, a long uh, battle ahead of yeah. you. It's just not a not an easy weed to deal with. Okay, I think we have maybe time for one more question. No, we don't. We have we are running out of time for tonight. But uh, hey, thank you for all the great advice and great information and all the great calls out there. And uh, tune in next time.